good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, uh, Berkeley Arts and Ideas live online. Uh, we are presenting uh, a program uh, this afternoon uh, called Sense and Sensibility. We're researching and collecting around the ritual spice box. My name is Francesco Spagnolo. I'm the curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. Uh, where the spice box we're discussing is uh, is located, is stored and exhibited. And uh, with me is Molly Robinson. Molly, you want to unmute yourself so that we can hear your voice. Welcome. Hi, I'm here. Good, good to see you. Good to find you again. And uh, this is a series of encounters that we're actually uh, discussing today. Um, first of all, the encounter between myself and Molly during a graduate seminar this semester offered by several departments and units, uh, history, Jewish studies and music, uh, on archives and collections and thinking about archives and collections and their rituals in a way. And, uh, and then also Molly's encounter with, uh, uh, with a specific object. And so Molly's, your, your reflections on, on that and what you've learned. Uh, part of the, uh, the seminar this uh, semester involved uh, exposing students to not just the Magnus collection, but uh, which as a, as, a, uh, as a reminder is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and it's part of UC Berkeley, it's been part of UC Berkeley for, for a decade now. Uh, so not just an encounter with, uh, with, the, with the collection, but also uh, an encounter with our exhibitions. So almost each week, uh, students were asked to study, to research past exhibitions of the Magnus, which are nicely archived on our website, magnus.berkeley.edu. And, um, and consist, these archives consist of uh, images of installations, uh, labels, uh, sometimes videos, etc. So we'll explore some of them together. But first of all, let's just look for a second at this uh, spice box. Molly, you, you encountered it as in, we were almost about to transition into remote teaching and shelter in place when you said to me, I'm interested in this object from this exhibition. What 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 tickles mm -hmm. your imagination here? Okay, can you can you hear me? Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had really poor timing. <laughs> right, we were going to do a handling session with this spice box, but um, I think what stood out to me is just the sort of lifelike presence of this silver object. Um, I really loved the. Um, spiraling filigree, the sort of viney tendril-like legs. Um, and so I actually knew nothing about its ritual function and it was more just sort of how um, striking it was visually that made me really interested in it. And then um, I saw that it was in the portable memories grouping. Um, so that sort of got me thinking about spice boxes as things that people carried around um, that were small enough to hold. Uh, but then there's something about its shape that's so unwieldy. So um, that's kind of interesting to me. Something that I, I, I really enjoyed in this initial interaction is that I sense when you brought this to my attention, that you were wanting to look at this, that you were not really aware of the fact that this is actually a ritual object and it's a ritual about scent. It's, uh, it's a box that uh, contains spices that are to be smelled on specific uh, occasions according to the Jewish calendar. And, uh, uh, but of course you couldn't meet it in person. So one of the things you did is you actually, uh, Molly's also an artist, so you actually drew it. So here, here's your drawing, a uh, digital drawing. So a, a way of uh, uh, getting closer through distance learning. And so from the, from the photograph that was shared with the class here is, uh, your drawing, and we'll, we'll get to it uh, a little later. I wanted to give a, a, an overview of the whole exhibition and, and, and in which this spice box was located. So I'm going to just share some ideas about that and then we can focus on, on the spice box, on smell and what it means to smell when we're all separated by the screens of our computers. Uh, the exhibition was called Memory Objects, Judaica Collections and Global Migrations and uh, was presented uh, last year in 2019 at the Magnus at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, for those who are interested, there is a short URL at the bottom of the screen, uh, bit.ly slash memory objects. Uh, you can, as I was saying, access the whole exhibition archive, including installation photos. This is uh, the gallery where the exhibition was installed and, uh, and uh, also all kinds of information. So this exhibition centered on what is the core 
Judaica collection of the Magnus. It was, uh, it was an initially a private collection, was acquired by the Magnus 50 years ago, between 67 and six, 1967, 1968. And uh, over the last decade, and uh, along with the collection that included a variety of objects, from textiles to small objects, like the one you're working on, Molly, uh, large synagogue textiles, painted manuscripts, and we'll see a few of those books, and so on, about 450 or 500 objects, uh, all, all included, were collected by, uh, by a man by the name of Siegfried Strauss, who collected, was born in, in, uh, in Germany and collected, began to collect in Germany, and started a little bit right before World War I, but especially in the interwar period. Along with the objects, we also received, and here you see a few in, on, this, on your screen, you see a few of the pages, a detailed catalog in which the collector most likely with the help of a scholar, um, documented all of the holdings uh, one by one. Uh, over, the, uh, over the years, we've been studying uh, these objects and reconstructing the collection from, from the beginning and also the history of the collection itself. What's, uh, what's interesting about this collection is not only the variety of materials that it includes, mostly European, but also North Africa, sometimes going as far as, as the Indian subcontinent, uh, but it was collected, and, and so that's mostly what we reconstructed in the interwar period. It was a time of a great, the previous great refugee crisis. And many of these objects entered private and public collections at the time in Europe because migrants were, were leaving and falling empires and they needed to fund their migration process and sold their belongings to, uh, to dealers, and to collectors, to museums. And in a way, this is the time in which the term Judaica really acquires the, the sort of the, the currency that we, we uh, use today. As, uh, in other words, these are objects that entering private and public collections become also commodities, start having a value, and dealers uh, attach a price to them. And, but in most cases, they're sold by, uh, by refugees or migrants of various, uh, various kinds. We researched the collection, this is an example, how we researched the collection in detail. And, and in a way, this exhibition was the coronation of about a decade of work to restructure our knowledge of, uh, of these materials. Uh, knowledge that, uh, uh, that we can see applied in, in the exhibition archive. For example, uh, this, uh, this uh, pretty impressive and you know, in real life, quite long, several feet long. Uh, this is a Kabbalistic arboreal tree you see on the screen, all of the emanations of the of the sefirot. It's a it's a chart that maps the the emanations of of, of God according to to Luriani Kabbalah. Um, we're able to dive more deeply into what uh, the initial collector knew, um, and uh, in this case, through digital photography, I was able to identify the author of the uh, of the manuscript, uh, uh, Per Hefter, who was a very interesting. Jewish heretic in the early part of the 17th century who lived between Prague and, and Mantua. Um, in other cases, we, and, and, and this is an example of an exhibition label where we have at the bottom the note of the collector, how, what, what Victor Strauss knew, and then the kind of information that was created at the Magnus through research. Uh, in some cases, we were able to debunk uh, the knowledge that the collector had of his collection. In this case, for example, this beautiful manuscripts for the counting of the Omer, which actually follows the, the, the Jewish calendar just these days, uh, the, the collector was attributing it to, to a, a known artist who painted synagogues in Southern Germany. Uh, were clearly, that was not him. But in these notes, the collector also highlights why he was collecting. Um, Siegfried Strauss, as I was saying, started collecting in the interwar period continue after World War I. In the 1930s, uh, he was able to, as soon as the Nazis went to power in Germany, was able to secure safe passage uh, for his collection to London. And he himself was arrested in the aftermath of Kristallnacht, but was able to pay ransom, free himself, join his collection in London, continue to collect there. And as we see in this, uh, in this note of the collector was collecting specifically to document a Jewish past that was felt to be shattered and under, under direct attack. He's, he's saying that such uh, paintings, synagogue paintings like this one have been, were actively being destroyed by the Nazis uh, in the 1930s. Um, 
we had a bunch of questions that came with this project and they were part of what we discussed with, with our class, Molly. So uh, the, the, the whole idea of how a collection of this kind could come together, what's the relationship between collecting and migration and uh, public collecting and migration. And, and we're think, we were thinking also about uh, today's forms of collecting. Uh, one out of seven human being, beings in, on earth are in transit. And while cultural heritage is typically still described as static, and even digital tools don't allow us to map, like when we take photos with our phones, we, can't, uh, we can only map that image to one location. So multi-locational approaches, diasporic, migratory studies and digital tools don't really work. Uh, we are, of course, keenly aware of the fact that the culture of the future is, uh, is global, is multi-locational, is diasporic, and so we need to find ways to, uh, to, to describe it also in that way. More specifically, we were interrogating with this exhibition what are Judaica collections, how cultural heritage, cultural heritage enter the collecting and museum world, and, uh, and also what is the global value of these collections such as the Magnus today. And we're discovering it with you, Molly, because you don't come from Jewish studies. Your approach is, is from, from, uh, from anthropology and folklore. And, uh, but I think that these are the questions that we all share, right? How do we curate and discuss culture and emotion? And how do we understand the fragments of the world? And uh, the Strauss collection and the exhibition were also animated by a relationship with dealers. Uh, the exhibition had was was uh, augmented by a uh, an inventory of a of a dealer in Freudenheim who was active in Berlin in the 1920s and uh, this is his catalog with a beautiful art deco uh, cover and uh, nowadays uh, art dealers would have websites but uh, in this case uh, and we animated the the the, the, the catalog, the photo catalog, we'll get back to this, but this is to give you just a sense of what uh, the exhibition was also including. Um, again, as I was saying, nowadays an art dealer would have a, a website, in this case a photo album would suffice and would be used to show potential prospective clients uh, what was available. Uh, we know of Ernst Frandenheim that he was collecting from refugees and we reconstructed his story as well. And we were able to also uh, determine how one object, this plate on the right in color uh, in the Strauss collection, was in the catalog of Ernst Freudenheim. So these two stories kind of met. And again, this is another uh, meeting in, uh, in, uh, in how we are uh, thinking about this project and where the Spike Fox we're about to discuss uh, belongs in a way. What's, what's the story behind this, uh, this object? In the exhibition at the Magnus, we carried this idea even further. And so we uh, invited, and this was for a class I was teaching at the time, we invited refugees to class, uh, refugees who have recently relocated to the Bay Area, and we invited them to bring their own memory objects, the, the objects that reminded them of home, and then collaborating with, uh, with, a, uh, with a documentary filmmaker, um, Citizen Film in San Francisco, a documentary was created that was also part of the installation, just to give you a taste of what that was. And again, to think about the currency of these objects that are in a collection in storage. And I want to uh, reassure all, all of our viewers today, they're safely stored and we care for them even in, uh, in, uh, in this time of, uh, of social distancing. Um, and here's an example of what we discussed. Here are some of the refugees that... <laughs> My neighbor in Syria, he was making many stuff out of silver, and he made this for me one year before the war. He wrote my, my first name in Arabic on the top, and when you open this 
heart, you will find my last name inside. And this means a lot to me because I loved my neighbors. They were like family for us. Yeah, it represents to me love, home, family, friends, fun, all these things that I am missing now. I remember it when I look at this. The bowl was a wedding present that my parents got when they married in 1930. My father uh, left in April of 1938. He had been the last Jewish doctor in Germany to treat a general uh, patient body, and it was illegal by then. But he had persisted in it because for a while he was the only doctor in this village, and he was very well liked there. In any event, he had to finally leave. You couldn't bring anything with you to speak of. But the one thing my mother insisted on bringing was this wedding present. So I remember this. She packed it in a hat box, and we schlepped it along uh, as we went up to Bremerhaven to get on the, the, uh, the ship, uh, carrying it very carefully. I don't want this object to be forgotten. I don't forgotten. want this object it to be forgotten. Part of uh, the ritual of collecting is really uh, collecting objects uh, for posterity, for the future, for memory. Uh, but also very much for us to understand what the, the stories behind collecting are. And so as we uh, start studying together a, a single spice box, silver filigree, stamped Krakow, most likely 18th century, collected by Siegfried Strauss in the early part of the 20th century. Let's also remember these words by the, the Somali British poem, poet, uh, Washington Shire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. And think about how these, all these objects ended up in the treasures of the Magnus at Berkeley for us to study the past and maybe even the present. Here it is, Molly. This is the, 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 the object that caught your attention. And uh, you were saying you were, you were sort of uh, enticed by, by the delicacy of it. Uh, what else did you, did you find out? What, what, what happened to it? Um, right, thanks. Um, so I guess maybe I'll start to Francesco. Um, you know, the catalog that you put together for this exhibition was um, really remarkable for a couple of different reasons. But one of them, um, there's, I think, an excerpt on the next slide. Here it is. Right. So you have the description of the spice box listed next to Strauss's um, collector's note. And I think that um, this really draws attention to how objects are differently construed when they cross institutional boundaries and when they change hands. And so I really saw the exhibition catalog as bringing together um, the voices of many historical uh, actors, yourself as a curator, um, Strauss as a collector, your students who helped um, with the exhibition. And so I thought that this, this catalog was really multivocal in a way, which um, seems kind of challenging to do. But um, on the next slide, um, this is- it's sort Strauss's of, own catalog, right? Right. So we have sort of layers of catalogs here, but that collector's note, it comes from a page in his collector's catalog that uh, lists the spice boxes in his collection. Um, and so the challenge here is kind of, how do we uh, treat this as a primary source and, and what questions do we ask of it? Um, and if you'll go back for, for one second, Francesco. Um, so notice that for the fourth entry, um, the silver box form miniature spice box, uh, Jewish workmanship is underlined. Um, and so these are the questions, right? Like, why is it underlined? Was this a consequential choice? Um, how do we view these choices as evidence of Strauss's motivations as a collector? Um, and so now, if we home in on Strauss's, the previous slide. Here we go. Great. Yeah, his, his note here. Um, so this is the description of the spice box that we're working with. And note that he questions whether the work is Polish or Moravian. Um, he also says that silver ceremonial objects stamped Krakow are extremely rare. Um, and the questions that uh, sort of arise here is why did he think that this work was Polish or Moravian? And then what makes objects stamped Krakow rare? Um, and so we'll keep those questions in mind as we move forward. 
Um, but now that uh, we have established this link between Freud and Heim and Strauss, um, we know that they overlapped and we can assume that Strauss was familiar with these ball form spice containers. And so we're seeing photos of the, of the catalog of the dealer, the Judaica dealer Freud and Heim, along on the top left with the, the one spice box we're studying, right? So other right. types of spice boxes, yeah. And it, and it feels kind of like fate in a way that these objects were brought together in the exhibition. Um, and so we know that Strauss is probably familiar with um, spice boxes in their myriad shapes and forms. Um, and Freudenheim actually has several spice boxes in his inventory that look strikingly similar to the one that Strauss collected. Um, and so Francesco has uh, outlined it in a red box. And I think we can zoom in on this cousin of our spice box. Um, so what's really interesting about these filigree containers is that um, the spaces between the fine wires of the filigree actually form these kind of natural apertures where you can imagine the herbs or the spices would have been poking out. So um, the scent wouldn't necessarily be trapped inside when it wasn't being used in its ritual setting. Um, so the spice most commonly associated um, with Havdala, the ritual ceremony in which spice boxes are used is myrrh or myrtle. Um, but there are plenty of other examples of different spices being used. So um, nutmeg. So let remind our, our, our viewers, the Havdala ceremony is the one that marks the end of the Sabbath or a holiday. And it involves, and we'll get closer to it because we've done our research and we've done interesting research on that. But it involves several blessings on various aspects, right? So on, on wine, on fire, and of course, on spices, on scents. Right, and um, so this is what this is used for. I learned so much from Francesco because like I said, I had no idea uh, what kind of ritual context um, these spice boxes were used in. Um, but myrrh is uh, very symbolically significant in Judaism. It's one of the species um, that's listed for the festival of the tabernacles or the feast of the tabernacles rather. Um, but one of the questions that we had was why, why myrrh? And um, one of the ideas is that myrrh is endemic to Europe and it's ubiquitous, it's really common. And so um, basically we have here sort of an instance of like what is available conditioning um, what is used in these rituals. So myrtle was in Hebrew hadas, which actually becomes then one of the names for the Jewish names for the spice box, right? Right. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's ubiquitous. Here are more of this uh, type. So clearly, yeah. this uh, this object has company, right? So we we were able to find some context, some distant context, right, for mm -hmm. for all of this. And so um, Francesco has uh, very kindly outlined in uh, red boxes again the other ball form containers in Freudenheim's inventory. But like you can kind of see, uh, the sky was the limit in terms of shapes. Um, someone was like, "Why not make a spice box that looks like a fish?" Um, mm -hmm. Which is really interesting because we think of fish as having a very particular smell or fragrance, but here mm -hmm. this silver fish would have maybe smelled like myrtle. Yeah, and um, we learned, you know, historically a variety of spices could be used, myrtle for sure, but for instance, uh, you know, this is a little bit of waving my Italian flag, but Italian Jews instead who had access to the spice routes through Venice and, and, uh, and the, the Ottoman Empire were able to import uh, uh, all kinds of other scented spices and use them and fill their boxes with them. We also learned that not all Jewish uh, uh, communities across the diaspora use these boxes, right? It's, uh, it's uh, very specific to mostly European Jews, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and here are more of them, and especially the very recurrent shape of the tower. Right. Um, so, yeah, the, I'm going to talk about the tower in just a moment, but I want to return to the questions of why Strauss thought that um, our spice box was Polish or Moravian work. So we know that in um, medieval Europe, um, and early modern Europe, Jews were often excluded from guilds or banned from forming guilds. Um, but there were some exceptions. So in 17th century Poland, Lithuania, and Moravia, Bohemia, um, Jewish silversmiths, bookbinders, and painters began forming their own guilds. 
Um, and by 1648, which was incidentally the, um, the end of the Thirty Years' War, there were a number of Jewish guilds that had been established actually in Krakow and Lvov. Um, and so Strauss may have thought that the container came from a Jewish workshop uh, in Poland or Moravia. Um, but the question about uh, the Krakow stamp is being rare is a, a bit more difficult to answer. So originally I thought that this had something to do with basically um, materials from Poland not surviving the um, invasion of Poland by Russia or the war, um, or had something to do with with the, proprietor, the proprietors of these objects not surviving. But um, it's a, it might be a little bit more complicated. So I don't know much about silver hallmarks, but that could be a kind of interesting future direction for, for research. Um, so I'm assuming that on a lot of these spice boxes, even um, spice boxes that have like a city mark might not necessarily have the purity standard, which is basically what made silver objects commercially viable. Um, and so when you have the standard and you know uh, the purity of the metal alloy, that's what means that, that's what basically makes it possible to sell the silver, which can then be melted down and used anew. Um, but if Jewish silversmiths and goldsmiths weren't in guilds, um, a lot of these standards actually had to be regulated by a national assay office. And so um, it's kind of unclear why the hallmarks might be different, but they almost certainly would have been different um, because they were being made by Jews. So, so in other words, objects made by Jews, that's what you're suggesting, were not designed to then become commercially viable, but they're designed to be used. Right, um, which really I think is, is very provocative because it, thinks, it, it helps us think through the ways in which these objects are sort of mired in different value regimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, even more so, they, they are memory objects. They're very personal and often family heirlooms passed on from one generation to, to the next, or as in these cases, most likely sold by migrants who needed to fund uh, their travels. Right. Um, and so, right, we're, ba we're back with the towers here. So um, the turret form spice towers have definitely received the most attention of any of the sort of shapes of, of spice boxes. Um, and they became widespread in Germany in the 16th century. Um, and we received a question about um, why these boxes look like towers. Yes, and as a reminder, our audience can post questions in the Q&A and when we finish wrapping up this conversation, we'll look at what kind of questions we had and answer those as well. Great. Um, and so one towers. I, right, so towers. One idea is that, um, these ceremonial objects actually resemble Christian reliquaries and monstrances, and, and they do. So there are records of Christian goldsmiths actually making spice towers for Jews, and then um, Jewish silversmiths and goldsmiths keeping reliquaries and monstrances, which were these kind of prized ritual objects that would have been very expensive on loan. Um, and so in each case, this would have meant that Jews and Christians were familiar with and borrowing from each other's material culture. It's this really interesting um, place of overlap. Um, so the tower form is likely at least partially influenced by the shape of these uh, reliquaries and monstrances. But another idea is that the tower form goes back even further than that um, to antiquity, basically, and actually follows the form of secular Yemenite censers, which is a kind of um, prototype for spice boxes. Um, and those censers would have been used to burn incense. Incense or, yeah, or other, other scented spices at the end of the meal, the last meal of the Sabbath, right? Right. Um, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Francesco. Um, uh, well, I, actually, what I wanted to say about this is that uh, we're, we're not sharing all of our research, but we, we met pretty much weekly uh, throughout these months of, uh, of social distancing on, online, Molly and I, and, and went through all kinds of panoply of possibilities here. And uh, I have to say, Molly, you left very, very few stones unturned. Uh, <laughs> it was phenomenal to see you struggle with rabbinic texts uh, that uh, in a way present, so the Talmud still inherits the, the, the 
the, what you're, you're pointing to, the fact that there is an ambiguity in, in, the, in the origin of spice boxes. Are they uh, just to use, used to smell something that smells good and a later explanation goes back to Maimonides that it's a way to revive the soul at the end of the, of the Sabbath. So they kind of have a medical sort of use, uh, spiritual medical uh, sort of views, or whether they, and, and the Talmud goes back, and the whole discussion in the Talmud is about whether this blessing over sen- smelling the, the spices should be said before or after the blessing after the meal. In other words, brings back this ceremony, which nowadays is separated from the, sa- the last of the Sabbath meals, uh, and happens after the end of the Sabbath, after sundown, uh, um, where, whereas, whereas the, 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 the smelling of, of incense at the end of the meal meant that the last meal continued past sundown. And, and so it's, it reflects a much older, much more ancient ritual. And so in other words, again, these objects embody a lot more, a lot, many more encounters and encounters between uh, cultures. The, the origin of that uh, sense, smelling of, of incense is, uh, is mm, Hellenistic in, in, uh, in nature. So it really brings us back through history. So these objects have as we are discovering a lot of power that goes in many different directions. Um, One of the issues that we had with this was how to understand how such objects are used in real life. And uh, generally, when I work with students on, on, on ritual objects, the one thing that I invite students, sometimes I put it in my syllabi, so they have to do this, but I usually invite students to go to synagogue. Berkeley has quite an incredible Jewish community with all kinds of uh, different types of rituals and, and denominations and ideas about how Judaism is, uh, is practiced. So it's, it's a good point of observ- observation. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, during social distancing, uh, these rituals were not done communally and it was impossible for you, Molly, to, to, to join them. Um, we have learned actually that many, uh, many synagogues hold have the last ceremonies at the end of the Sabbath on Zoom. So Zoom is becoming also a ritual platform uh, in its own right. But uh, we, we performed another type of uh, uh, social distant field work. Um, one of the things I did, Molly, if you remember, was that I jumped on YouTube. And again, with the idea that, uh, that uh, the Havdalah is a ritual that's practiced after the, the, the day of the Sabbath at the time in which even the, uh, those communities that do not use electricity, electronics uh, during the Sabbath do use them because uh, the week starts at the end of the Sabbath. Uh, so there are many videos online that depict uh, live have the last ceremonies. We've selected just a few, but you and I have been scouting uh, YouTube back and forth to find um, videos that were represented. Most times this community that depicts themselves. So they're relatively authentic. Uh, testimonies, but it prompted us to discuss, of course, what it is, what can we do with uh, socially distant field work, right? Uh, you, you're, you're a full chorus, you, you, you know the value of field work, and uh, what, what happened going to YouTube to you? And then we, we showed you examples, but what, how, how did it feel for you? Um, it was a really interesting uh, experience to, to basically be on Zoom watching a video together, and it was actually really helpful because we could pause the videos and, you know, we were debating, I was like, I saw four spice boxes and you were like, no, they're just three. And Mm -hmm. a person doesn't use this one. And so it was really actually super helpful to be able to pause and sort of look at what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's a really wonderful way to kind of work around the constraints of what this period of time is bringing us. So together we travel the the world through YouTube and this is from a, a modern Orthodox Ashkenazi congregation in South Africa. And it's, a, it's the youth group of the congregation that meets. And so it's mostly young people. And uh, in, a, in a sort of where is Waldo uh, uh, approach, uh, we're inviting uh, ourselves and our viewers to follow the spice boxes. How many are there? Uh, Molly, can you guide us to this video before we watch it? Yeah, sorry, I was looking at some of the questions. Um, so maybe it will challenge people to count how many they see and then uh-huh. afterward. But um, one thing I will say is that um, it's not just spice boxes that are being used for, for scent and fragrance. Um, so maybe keep an eye out for yeah. that. 
So as you watch, this is just a couple minutes and it, we're also using this because there is a, a translation of the Hebrew at the bottom. So it's, uh, it's user friendly for many of our viewers. Uh, but uh, yes, follow the spice boxes. Now you've seen a variety of them, so you know where the shapes are and see where they go. Yes, one sees all the all the movements of the of the various spice boxes, including one that is not uh, silver, ritually made in in any way, right? Uh, right, the kitchen spices. Um, yes, which... something that in California we would buy at Trader Joe's <laughs> or Whole Foods, right? Yeah, and I think that what's really neat about that is it really speaks to the importance of the ritual and. Um, making do with what's available and in a congregation with a lot of people um, and everyone needs to smell the spices. I think it's a wonderful kind of work around or a way of, of um, continuing the practice um, in spite of like maybe the constraint of not having enough silver turret form boxes. I, I see that in chat there is a there is a question of, about whether decorated spice boxes are used in all traditional Jewish communities around the world. We're seeing now uh, Havdalah by a, an influential Yemenite rabbi in Israel, uh, and there is no box to be seen. It's just uh, branches of myrtle, the hadas that gives one of the names, the Hebrew names to the spice box, that is uh, that is being used. So let's let's just watch a little bit. So. In other words, uh, the spice box is uh, maybe a, a, a luxury item from, uh, from Europe more than, than anything else. Uh, I mean, from Europe from long ago, of course. There it is. There it is. The smelling directly of the of the metal. Uh, leaves. Um, among the, the, the videos we found, there was one that has pretty interesting one. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, music. The, the music is a sort of a Hasidic pop, but it's a, it's a video, a historic video of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York in 1976, celebrating Havdalah. This is just a short excerpt. excerpt. Uh, the, the ceremony started, it was at the end, not just of the Sabbath, but also of a, of a festival of the festival of Shavuot. 
and uh, and the, the the whole of the last ceremony, which we've seen, can take if one recites things uh, quickly, uh, only a few minutes. It was celebrated from 1:30 a.m. until 4 a.m. So um, uh, what's interesting about this video is that the Rebbe, the, the prized authority of this uh, of this uh, community, important uh, community. Once he's presented with the spice box, says, and we learned this from the commentary of the video, says, no, I don't want the, spi the spice box. Take the spices out of the box, uh, most likely to acquire a, a, a more intense experience. So the box can also be there and not be used, right? So we, well, we found all sorts of uh, options. Let's watch this quickly. And forgive us for the music. It's 1.30 a.m., just after Myriv, Matzai Shabbos and Matzai Shavuos, Tavshin Lamed Vav 1976. Noticing a new silver spice box, the Rebbe asks that the spices be removed from the box. Smelling the Vesamim. <laughs> On occasion, the Rebbe would look into the spilled wine. Mayor Harlick assists as Rebbe prepares to distribute the Kaisal Bracha, the cup of blessing. And uh, we could keep uh, watching YouTube, uh, and we did, right, Molly? You and I did uh, for a long time. And I see in chat other uh, uh, viewers are suggesting uh, additional sources for uh, socially distant ritual field work. Uh, we were also asking the question of what the value of this type of field work is, of course. Uh, but it feels like between uh, studying together rabbinic sources, uh, watching rituals, looking at uh, ritual objects and discussing their and researching their history and building quite a bibliography uh, that we've done, we've crossed a couple of, of T's this time, right, Molly? And, uh, and then we went the extra mile because in a way, this whole conversation was really prompted by your work as an artist. And so again, as a form of social distance research, you, you did this uh, drawing. Um, I have to say, I. I really like it, so that's one of the reasons why <laughs> this whole thing uh, went uh, in all sorts of directions, I think, and we're presenting today. But uh, actually, your drawing also pointed me to appreciate more the crown that's at the base of the, that I had not really taken notice of so much while looking at the object in, uh, as it, as can we, how can we say, in real life. Uh, so there is definitely a value. Uh, of studying something, and, and maybe this type of drawing is a form of transcription, like, you know, that one would do transcribing a, an oral history or, or, or any kind of report or music or song and so on. So how, how did you approach this, uh, this idea of drawing uh, the box? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure that if we had been in um, a normal setting in a non-socially distant world that I would have thought to draw it, but um, since I guess shelter in place started, I've been drawing a lot. And the next best best thing after actually visiting with the object, which it'll be kind of funny when I finally, hopefully, fingers crossed, get to encounter the spice box in real life. But the one of the next best things sort of seemed like drawing it. And I think, you know, for me, methodologically, I'm kind of working through these questions of how my art can can sort of facilitate scholarship. And I think that one of the things about making art is that um, there's so much to gain in the process. And by using drawing as a meditation and a way of encounter, it sort of de-emphasizes the product um, and makes it more about the exploration or, or the journey of getting to know something. Um, so I felt really grateful for being able to have that kind of time um, to look at 
the object and encounter it in this way. And so when you asked if, if I'd be interested in donating it, I was like, absolutely, <laughs> of course. Well, that was my instinct as curator. And so <laughs> collecting not for myself, but for the Magnus and for UC Berkeley. And the Magnus has been doing quite some collecting in recent years, but uh, in, in this time of uh, social distancing, collecting is, uh, presents its own challenges. Uh, this was a phenomenal opportunity to kind of capture and uh, in a way both our research but also the type of interest that, uh, that uh, a little object, it's tiny. The, the, the original box is very tiny and very delicate can, can create. So now we see Molly Robinson's uh, um, uh, drawing along with a museum-like uh, label. So should, should your drawing be on display in a future exhibition of the Magnus, it will have a label like this. So we, we investigated exactly how you create it. You use Procreate and Apple Pencil. We're not, we're not endorsing any, any specific uh, maker of, uh, of, uh, of computer equipment. Uh, the, the, the DPIs of the image that we collected and it now has an accession number and the accession number is 2020.1. It means that it was the first item collected by the Magnus in 2020. So it, it will be recorded and, and all of this will be recorded in the collection for, uh, for time to come. In a, in a way, this is, this is also, uh, and collecting is also a ritual. And, as you, and you experience that because our colleague, Julie Franklin, the registrar of the Magnus was involved in, uh, in, uh, in securing this uh, wonderful gift. And so you, you had to fill out all the forms and everything. So you know what it, what it means to donate an object to, to a collection into the Magnus. And we debated it uh, at length, whether we should, uh, even though we're all very excited about it, whether it would be something to collect or not. It actually uh, connects with other aspects of the Magnus collection and other portraits of objects that were done a few years ago for, for a different project by a local uh, Bay Area artists. So, uh, it, it, it finds all kinds of new contexts. And so thank you for doing this and for contributing to, to the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was how just does gonna... it feel to, to have it in a collection? <laughs> well, I was just going to say it, it feels um, a little bit surreal. But when you were speaking, Francesco, I was thinking about one of the essays that you and Ethan had us read in. Um, in the class. Ethan, is with Ethan Katz was uh, the, the, my co-instructor for the seminar with, we met in. Oh, right. And had this uh, semester, yes. And so? And uh, um, we read Walter Benjamin's Unpacking My Library. Mm -hmm. um, and he talks about um, what it's like to be a collector and all of the sort of like childlike excitement that comes along with collecting. But he says that um, one of the greatest thrills of collecting is the the thrill of acquisition and basically having bringing something into a collection that com completes the magic circle of mm -hmm. objects and so I think that what feels really special is kind of having created something that can be included in that circle and really gets at the nature of um, what you and Ethan have been suggesting all semester which is that archives are created and they're constantly being changed and constructed so I really appreciated um, the opportunity to get to think about that. And we appreciate your ideas and those of all the other fantastic students in the seminar. We had about 10 students and worked really hard and we were able to move into online instruction quite seamlessly, uh, even though we all miss uh, working with objects hands-on. Uh, but we'll be back. We'll, we'll do that as well. Uh, this brings us to, to sort of the end of our uh, conversation, Molly. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this was Molly Robinson, who is a graduate student in folklore at uh, UC Berkeley. My name is Francesco Spagnolo. I'm the curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. Magnus.berkeley.edu is the website of the Magnus at UC Berkeley. And um, we can maybe see what kind of questions. Uh, we had some uh, encouraging comments, so I guess we have fans. Uh, but uh, let's see, uh, let's see what, uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, what kind of uh, 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 comments of, of, uh, of, of requests we have. Um, so here we are. And so we'll spend the, just the last few minutes of this uh, uh, webinar. And we want to also thank Nat Honsan from, from
from uh, from the Magnus for moderating the the chat online and and uh, and uh, so let's see. Well, I think that we we kind of address the issue of castle. It's more it's more tower than castle uh, uh, shaped, and and also we discussed the the issue of of scent and. Molly, you and I actually talked a whole lot about uh, scent and sensibility, right? Right. Well, I mean, so this is something I've been thinking a little bit more about um, for my paper, but um, there, w one of the things that I think we explored was the connection between scent and memory. Um, and there are probably many people actually just in attendance who know much, much more about this than I do. But um, the Proust phenomenon is basically this idea that um, certain smells can evoke or elicit autobiographical memory. Um, and what's interesting here is that scent is actually being harnessed to provoke memory. And it's, um, and it's more of like a collective memory, I'd say, right? Um, the memory of this covenant between God and the people of Israel. Um, and so, when we think about olfaction and memory, I think it's definitely important to sort of consider the kind of memory we're, we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what you just said is also a big shout out to, to Jewish studies and why Jewish studies can be relevant in, in our university and what we can do with it. So thank you for that as well. There are a few other comments. A, 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 Judith Bloom uh, wants us to talk with, I guess, with me with the Magnus about a spice box that looks like the one uh, in the in the collection that we discussed. So maybe, and, and I think there might be a similar one somewhere in Berkeley uh, to be researched as well. So we'll we'll find out more. And then there is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, the the viewer is Catherine Young. And when objects are museumed, are brought into a museum collection, they typically lose all of their sensory qualities except the visual. So I'm curious about why you elected to focus on the spice box visible and material properties uh, to the exclusion of smell. Well, I think it was a little, uh, Molly, help me out here, but I think it was a little difficult to, to carry <laughs> smell across Zoom. Um, but we evoked the various types of smells that uh, can be associated with a, with a spice box. In other words, it's, uh, this too is not a one-way street, right? Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of left to our imagination, but we, we discussed that as well. And, right. Uh, yeah. And I think, was it you, Francesco, who was saying um, you encountered this spice box that belonged to someone in your family and you actually didn't know what it was until you caught a whiff of it? Yeah. Um, so there's this way in which smell informs our understanding of what we're dealing with. Um, and that's really interesting too, because a lot of secular objects, I was reading a little bit about Anglo-Jewish silver, um, and actually um, sugar casters uh, in 19th century England were sort of adapted to serve as spice boxes. Um, and so there's a way in which maybe like the form of the object isn't as important as the way it smells. Um, but I think sort of connecting this question to Zoe's question. Um, Zoe Silverman is asking, I'm, I'm gonna read it and then you can, you can yeah. answer it. Could you share more thoughts about the sensory regime hierarchy, curriculum, et cetera, of the Havdalah ritual and how the material culture in the Magnus collection speaks to the sensory experience of Havdalah? This is a loaded question. <laughs> it's a wonderful question. It's such and, a good uh, question. Maybe next webinar we'll, we'll take another hour to, to answer that. But uh, if you have a, a, well, a thought to share, Molly, that would be fantastic. I was just thinking about, you know, um, I don't know what like the the cleaning ritual, so to speak, is for objects when they come into the collection. But we can imagine that like spice boxes that are sitting around the house or in domestic spaces or even in synagogues um, aren't necessarily cleaned or emptied out after they're used. And so um, this is how objects, I'm sure, kind of these spice boxes like build up a permanent kind of smell. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe i i don't know francesco does this particular spice box smell a, per, a certain way um mm -hmm. uh well you know as as the question the questions point out uh, there is a sort of a, a sterilization uh, in 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 the acquisition process of objects not all of them 
so it, I, don't, I don't know that it has the distinctive smell, but I can say that for other types of objects in the, in the collection, for example, ritual objects that even though they're not designed to do so, emit sounds, uh, we actually move them and record their sounds. And so we, we documented what, so even when they're behind the case, uh, our, our visitors can actually play online, can play a playlist of, of sounds that correspond to the objects. And this is a, another part. I don't know where we'll go, what the frontier of smell will be and whether we can re-evoke the, the, the movie theaters of the 1950s with Odorama. I, I, I'm not sure where my curatorial uh, uh, craze will, will go with this. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, but um, you know, I, uh, I, there was someone else who was uh, asking to please publish the pro provo provocative questions that were on the slides. And uh, we will actually publish the whole talk online, so the whole video and maybe also the slides. And again, you will find, I'm talking to our audience, you will find everything at magnus.berkeley.edu. So uh, continue to follow us, but uh, probably time to say farewell to our audience now, Molly, what do you think? Any parting thoughts? I just want to thank you because it's been a fantastic end of semester and a great way to, to activate the collection far beyond any hopes that I, I have. Yeah, and same. I mean, I just, I have so much gratitude for, for our talks and for the ability to do this research and have, you know, my mind be able to escape into a place that's, that's not necessarily um, limited by the virus. Yes. Uh, you know, from your mouth to your audience. <laughs> thank you so very much. And thank you everybody who contributed such wonderful uh, comments in chat, etc. cetera. We'll, we'll make treasure of everything and suggestions. And we do publish, the Magnus does publish videos of the various uh, Zoom webinars we're in and other talks that we're giving. Um, I actually will be presenting in the ex ne end of next week uh, for the Contemporary Jewish Museum, our newsletter uh, informed that and thank you Nat uh, for being with us even though we don't see I don't know Nat if you want to say hi in video or if you just want to keep hiding uh, behind the Magnus logo but uh, we really appreciate you uh, helping uh, uh, and being with us uh, today so and again thanks to the Arts and Humanities at UC Berkeley for hosting this series of live and online which definitely has been lively thanks to you Molly so uh, to be continued. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.